Hi again, I'm Roger Dean, Australisis and the Marx Research Institute. Welcome to the third of our five videos. This one is primarily about the science of music, whereas in the four performance videos, we've mainly discussed how creative musicians use musical materials and how they think about them. But even in Australisis, we've gone from practice-led research, where we allow the process of creating works to provide new understandings which constitute a kind of research to what we call research-led practice because by researching practice one can get insights into it which then allow new forms of practice so there can be a productive cycle. So to introduce the general areas of cognitive science of music, that is the research of music in cognition, uh, let's go back to the Marx Institute for Brain Behaviour and Development Director, Kate Stevens, who you met before. Hello, I'm Kate Stevens, and I'm the Director of Marx Institute for Brain Behaviour and Development at Western Sydney University. My own research training is in experimental psychology. I have a PhD in cognitive science, perceptual psychology, related to music uh, perception and cognition. I was particularly interested as a student in auditory sequences that unfold in time uh, and that aren't necessarily verbal. I was interested in the way those sequences are learned and cognized and recognized. So ultimately I was interested in memory for music. And music was a fantastic kind of a stimulus that I was able to use in a very systematic way. I was able to control and vary different features of the music to really probe and understand the features that are extracted by human listeners uh, and that are weighted differentially in recognition tasks. Most of the music at that time that I used was tonal music, but I did have one experiment uh, as a PhD student that used atonal kinds of stimuli as well. And we had a couple of different ways of really understanding uh, auditory pattern recognition with music as the, the kind of medium for that recognition. Um, one was to bring into relief some of the cognitive processes by comparing uh, listeners who were less or more experienced or trained in, in music. And another way that we tried to shed light on the cognitive processes in the recognition of music was to train up artificial neural networks, early computational models uh, that also extracted and weighted features differentially. And we use those little neural networks or models um, to map and to try and explain the reaction time and accuracy that we saw from human listeners as they were uh, responding to and recognising the different musical sequences. There's a couple of research projects that I've been involved with since uh, those PhD years that I think intersect quite well with Australisis's work. After my PhD, I had the good fortune to get involved with researchers and artists and scholars in the area of contemporary dance and seeing the body as the instrument in that particular art form that opened my eyes to the many dimensions and the many sensory systems that are engaged and stimulated by music or by dance. Uh, music itself, of course, is not only an auditory phenomenon, although that's the way I'd studied it as a PhD student. So dance was particularly intriguing. Um, and by contemporary dance, I mean where the medium is movement and that movement is cultivated for its own sake and with the intention of, of creating um, a work of art. Uh, so it was improvisation that was eventually edited and set as a, as a work, largely by professional uh, and expert uh, dance companies and groups that I worked with. But contemporary dance to a, an experimental psychologist and a cognitive psychologist was really fascinating because here was a phenomenon that was, of course, visual and motor, but it was also auditory. It was expressive and communicative. It didn't generally have text or words associated with it. And intriguingly, it was not very often notated. So here was a, a complex temporal sequence and it was fascinating to try and understand the way contemporary dance was passed on um, from generation to generation or to from one artist to another. Uh, it was fascinating to understand the different signatures, if you like, of choreographers and different uh, dance ensembles. And 
it was intriguing to also see the way cognition there was embodied and embodied no, not only in a single or individual dancer, but across the dance ensemble. So cognition there was also distributed. And if one watches a choreographer working and collaborating with a group of contemporary dance artists, it's also a dynamical system. Sometimes that system is centralized. Sometimes it is very much uh, distributed across the ensemble. So all of those kinds of aspects of contemporary dance um, were quite challenging to uh, some of the theories and concepts, I think, from perceptual and cognitive psychology. One of the ways that um, I came to think about it, having studied memory for music and also knowing the theory of uh, long-term memories for humans, being very much around knowledge that can be declared and in many cases, the knowledge that we think of as declared in, in studies of, of human memory are word-based or text-based. I was very interested in thinking of the ideas and the knowledge and the thoughts in contemporary dance as still being declared and declarative, but not declared in words, rather declared through and with the body. And I guess that's one aspect or one way I've thought about embodied cognition uh, in the context of dance. So it is, um, it is no less a cognitive kind of experience. It's certainly more than a motor program. Uh, and we can think of the ideas and knowledge as expressed through and with the body. So how to study that in an experimental sense and from a, a, the point of view of cognitive psychology? Well, one of the things that we've um, enjoyed doing is actually running our experiments with um, a, a group of dancers and running it in front of an audience. So one can then explore embodiment and perception and cognition, not only in the dancers, but also in the audiences. So we measure, for example, the motion of dancers. We can use motion capture to get at the kinematics of the dancers and we manipulate the, the conditions under which they perform. So one experiment had the small ensemble performing their piece in silence. So a visual only condition. Uh, they then performed it with the soundscape, so an auditory plus visual kind of a condition. And of course, the third condition is to present the soundscape without the dance, so a, a, an auditory only condition. So the audience are there. Um, they are responding uh, continuously with some devices that we developed. They're responding to those that artwork under those three different conditions. And we're interested in, in the uh, relationship between those conditions and audience response. We're also able to catch the motion of the dancer, as I mentioned, and of course we have the soundscape as another time series that we can use to predict or analyze um, the audience responses. We can also look at the impact uh, of the soundscape on the um, performer's memory. So is there any uh, change in performance when they are uh, moving in silence and without the perhaps the cues of the soundscape. There was a difference. Um, the work was about five minutes long. And we noticed when we analyzed it that the pauses or the stillnesses in the dance work were slightly compressed when the soundscape was absent. The dance work was about 5% shorter than it had been uh, when the soundscape was present. 5% is pretty good. The last study that I thought I'd touch on brings in the aspect of technology. And this is going back to um, the musical context, but still talking about audience response and trying to capture in real time um, audiences reactions to live performance. This was a study in collaboration with the Bionics Institute down in Melbourne, where the uh, researchers there had commissioned composers, six different composers to commission works, uh, particularly composed for cochlear implants. Cochlear implants are very reduced in the number of channels that uh, stimulate uh, the hearing system. And for that reason, the musical signal for people with cochlear implants is often very impoverished. Some lovers of music who do have cochlear implants later in life say that they, they often turn off the implant. So let's put it to the composers to really understand the limits of the cochlear implant technology, the, the limited number of channels. What would the music sound like? How would they compose under those conditions? Um, when we measured 
audience response. So we had people with cochlear implants, we had people with hearing aids, and of course we had match controls in the audience. Again, this is happening in real time and live. Um, the audience response data there indicating that rhythm, um, particularly important, so very strong rhythmic structures in some of the works were particularly well received by those with cochlear implants. Uh, percussive kinds of works are uh, very effective for the cochlear cochlear implantees as well. And of course, that auditory visual experience also very uh, rich and important for those uh, with cochlear implants. So a couple of studies there, particularly applying the experimental method to the idea of embodied cognition and multimodal and temporal cognition, which I think Australisis captures so beautifully Hi, my name is Dr. Jennifer McRitchie, and I'm a senior research fellow at the Marx Institute for Brain Behaviour and Development. I have a background in engineering, music and cognitive science, and I typically research through empirical measurements how individuals develop their skills as they learn a musical instrument and how performers use those skills both orally and visually to communicate with their co-performers and their audiences. I'm particularly interested in how we learn fine motor skills in this domain, and how we use our bodies to play and to listen to music. And I'd like to discuss how this relates to the Australisis program. Embodiment is the idea in psychology that our thought processes are linked to our bodily experience of the world. So not only are our thoughts and intentions made visible by our bodily interactions, but our bodily interactions can also shape our thought. So embodied music cognition is the study of these processes and the role of the body in musical activities, such as performing and listening. What we know from research is that the performer's body can essentially shape what we hear of a performance. For instance, there's evidence to show that the gestures used to perform a note, and here I'd like you to imagine a percussionist striking a drum, can actually make us perceive a note to be longer or shorter than it orally it is. I've conducted previous studies along with other international researchers to show that even though wider performers' gestures are fairly idiosyncratic, so the way a performer moves as they're performing a piece of music, they have a tendency to relate the thoughts they have about the musical structure of the piece, as well as times of peak interest or climax. And why this is important is as much for Western classical structures where there might already be a fair amount of agreement in terms of where a phrase begins and ends or where the climax of a piece would be, right through to more ambiguous structures where the performer can really be aiding the audience in their interpretation here um, with a clear view given from their bodily movements. This could be applied to the performance of contemporary music and experimental music. So for instance, in a typical Australisis performance, you see the performers playing their instruments and even their micro movements will be giving your brain some information on how they view the structure of what's being performed. And the types of gestures and movements you may see largely depend on the instrument interface and what type of visible interaction that it might afford. Again, in an Australisis performance, you may see the various traditional interfaces, like the acoustic grand piano for one, um, and the main gestural control here is the finger striking the key surface. Now that can be extended a step further by playing on the inside of the piano. So then the performer has a bit more that they can do in terms of striking and plucking the strings. And that leads to some different sounds. And that control can be extended again with the aid of various electronically extended instruments. One example of this being the magnetic resonator piano. And here there's more interaction possibilities on the surface of the key that lead to extended acoustic sounds from the instrument, such as pitch bends, vibrato, and infinite sustain. And all of these different types of gestures are communicating information to the audience on how the performer is viewing both the sounds and the overall music being performed.
So do we always need a performer to understand the music? You'll see that some Australisis compositions are performed on stage without a direct view of the performer or where the performer may not be interacting live with an instrument interface that allows a lot of visible communication. The absence of gestures can be just as important here. So knowing that these bodily movements, these gestures can frame the interpretation of sounds and ultimately a piece of music, it's often valuable to let the audience be their own interpreters by removing this filter, particularly where new sounds and intermedia are being created. And an example of this is in Felix's drone piece. So here where the interest is in the boundaries between events and that limit where people can sense that something has changed orally, the absence of a performer at the front of the stage means any of those visual hints that we would normally use to interpret that music are removed. And in this case, it may mean that audiences have more of a fluid perception of the sound. So here it may be more as Felix intends, one big event. I hope you enjoy the rest of the pieces and the commentaries and thank you for listening. I'm Peter Keller, a researcher at the Marx Institute for Brain Behaviour and Development. And I have a background in music, psychology, with a recent focus on neuroscience. My research aims at understanding how the brain enables us to interact and to communicate with one another through music. I'm interested in this mainly because the human ability to do so is not only remarkable due to our precision at it, we can see crowds of tens of thousands of people singing together, more or less together as one, but we're also very flexible at the ability to coordinate. We can do so in many different ways. And the types of interaction that you see in performances of Australisis represent a particularly interesting case of blending different elements of human and computer produced sounds and differing degrees of pre-planning versus improvisation. This presents unique challenges from a cognitive and brain sciences point of view. What would we see if we looked into the performers' brains as they played? We know from ongoing research that we'd not only see activity related to producing movements and perceiving sounds generated by those movements. We would also see activity related to making decisions about what to play and how to play it. And because performers are coordinating with one another, we'd see activity related to paying attention to the relationship between their parts. And this is of course a relationship that might be continuously changing and require quite a degree of cognitive effort to monitor. We'd also see activity related to predicting what co-performers would do, as well as activity related to reacting to what actually happens. Okay, and this might not always match up. These processes would differ in situations where the music's been rehearsed or where it's being improvised freely. But in both cases, the sounds of one's co-performers impact directly on the movement system of the brain. So predictions are easily translated into action and reactions are super fast as they need to be if we, if we need to support coordination in the range of tens of milliseconds as we see in expert ensemble performance. When things go smoothly, as we hope they do, we see evidence of the brain's reward system becoming activated as if the performers were enjoying a tasty meal or sharing a bottle of fine wine together. On the other hand, if things start to get shaky, we would see activity related to dealing with uncertainty and the need to take control of the situation. All these processes can be influenced to some degree by the amount of experience each performer has, as well as how well they know one another. Performers benefit not only from knowing what sounds their co-performers will play next, but also how they'll shape the sounds in terms of subtle expressive features, getting a bit faster here, a bit slower there. So familiarity with one another as musicians can have an impact on the interaction. There are also broader social implications. The musicians take note of how the audience is responding in live performance, and they can alter what they do in order to make communication as effective as possible. In this way, you can think of it 
as a channel of bi-directional information flow being set up. It's a situation of social interaction where the musicians can pass sounds reflecting thoughts and feelings among themselves and share the exchange with the audience. If we think about the even bigger picture, music might have evolved because it helps us to form social bonds with others, even in large groups. Now, introducing computer controlled sounds into the loop adds an extra dimension to the interaction. But in some ways, it's not really very different from how we interact with external events in the world around us. In daily life, we have to react and deal with things going on around us that we might not be able to produce ourselves or indeed even have control over. This process can be exciting to engage in and to witness, especially in the safe environment of a music performance. The worst thing that can happen is not terribly drastic. For this reason, new and adventurous forms of music making as practiced by Australisis are an especially good way to understand how and why we as humans interact through music. Hello, my name is Elena Smith, and I'm a PhD candidate at the Marx Institute for Brain Behavior and Development at Western Sydney University in Sydney. In my PhD thesis, I focus on emotion perception in unfamiliar music. I'm interested in finding out why we perceive specific emotions while listening to music and what makes music sound happy or sad. Is this due to our long term exposure to specific types of music, or is there perhaps something in the music itself that makes us perceive a piece of music as being happy or sad? I ask these questions as music is an important part of most people's daily lives. Music can have a great impact on our general well-being and on our emotions. Even though we all seem to have our own personal specific preferences to which types of music affect us emotionally, there seems to be some universal underpinnings of music that consistently elicit specific emotional responses in listeners. When conducting research on music, there are a lot of different aspects one can focus on. The focus in my thesis is mostly on pitch perception. We use the term pitch to describe the highness or lowness of a sound. Pitch is thereby a perceptual attribute of the physical acoustic signal. When we speak of the physical attribute of a sound wave, we refer to its frequency, which is measured in hertz. So frequency measures the cycle rate of a physical waveform, which results in the perception of pitch. The higher the frequency or the speed of the waveform, the higher the pitch of the sound we hear. Musicians use combinations of pitches that are then combined to form tone systems. A musical system consists of a set of pitches that are some form of mythical relation with each other. The way these systems are organized differs per musical culture, and this has led to an abundance of different musical systems. An example of such a system, and one that is currently the most common tuning system since the 18th century for Western classical music, is the 12-tone equal temperament. An important characteristic of any equal temperament is that there is the same frequency ratio between two adjacent pitches. In 12-tone equal temperament, the pitch set is repeated at what we call an octave. The octave is the interval between two musical pitches of which the higher pitch has double the frequency of the lower pitch. The octave is then divided into 12 equal steps on a logarithmic scale. The smallest step, so 1 12 of an octave, is called a semitone and many common Western musical systems repeat at the octave. And this system is also what you will hear when you listen to pop music, for example. This tuning system is widely used and most familiar to the majority of Western listeners nowadays. However, there are endless possibilities of pitch combinations and plenty of musical systems that differ from 12 tone equal temperament. And these systems can be connected with specific cultures such as five or seven note non-octave based scales that are used in, for example, Indonesian gamelan music. And some systems do use the octave, but they divide it into more than 12 pitches. So there are examples of musical cultures in some Arabic, Turkish and Indian systems that use up to 22 notes per octave. So when the octave is divided into more than 12 pitches, we call this microtonality. In microtonal systems, the intervals are distinctly different from 12 tone equal temperament. Some examples of microtonal systems are the uh, aforementioned 22 notes per octave, 
or a quarter tone system where the octave is divided into 24 quarter tones, the 31 tone system, or even 53 tones per octave. Another very interesting possibility is to get rid of any boundaries between pitches whatsoever and use a continuous pitch system. Using specific software, uh, my PhD supervisor, Roger Dean, has developed a grand piano that uses continuous pitches and therefore can play any type of pitch outside of any specific system. And one can also move away from the octave entirely. And this is what the bolin system does. In the bolin system, um, we use a so-called tritave as the repeating interval instead of the octave. The tritave is bigger than an octave and more or less equal to an octave plus a fifth. This tritave is then divided into 13 equal steps. And the interval one ends up with is slightly larger than 12 tone equal temperament semitones. Therefore, this system is also referred to as a macrotonal system. Compared to some of the earlier mentioned microtonal systems, the intervals in the bolin system mostly sound very unfamiliar. And therefore, it's a very interesting system to use in pitch perception experiments, where we attempt to figure out how people perceive unfamiliar music. As I mentioned, in my research, I'm interested in where emotional responses to music come from. It's difficult to examine this when people have been thoroughly exposed to one particular musical system, for example, mostly Western music. And with globalization, it is increasingly more difficult to find populations that have not been exposed to this type of music. One possibility is then to use unfamiliar musical systems that are mathematically so different from what we are used to here that it becomes possible to analyze which aspects of pitch have an effect on our emotional responses. We can also manipulate the amount of exposure people have with that system to further test how that influences their emotional responses. I conducted a few experiments where I used the bolin pier system and found that there are indeed several psychoacoustic features that affect people's responses. An example of that is pitch height. So the higher the pitch, the more pleasant people find the sounds. Another example is roughness. So if a combination of pitches are high in roughness, meaning that their frequency waves are so close together that it produces the perception of a beating sound, sounds are perceived as not so pleasant. These types of features are present in all pitches and are independent from musical culture. And they're also present in our common Western 12 equal tone uh, system. But as I mentioned, it is difficult to test their effect on pitch perception in Western populations, as other factors such as familiarity also have very strong effects. One would have to go to remote communities around the world to test how these factors impact perception in 12 tone equal temperament. I was lucky to be able to visit some remote villages in Papua New Guinea, where we tested perception of musical elements in 12 tone equal temperament. And we found that for some of uh, the psychoacoustic features, such as average pitch height, familiarity with the system highly impacts um, the emotional responses to that system, even though it is a feature that is intrinsic to the musical signal. So by using unfamiliar musical tuning systems or by studying remote populations, we can further examine how people perceive pitches and where our emotional responses to music come from. Hi, 
I'm Dr. Simon Chambers, a researcher here at Marx and at the Institute for Culture and Society at Western Sydney University. And one of my research interests is in this idea of unfamiliar music and how we can encourage audiences to go beyond their musical comfort zones. If we think of the music presented by Australisis, I suggest a lot of that falls into this category of the unfamiliar. And I mean that in terms of the ensemble's commitment to innovative musical sounds, the number of new works that they commission, and also the presence of improvised elements in a lot of the works that they present. We can also think of unfamiliar music at a much more personal level. So for each of us as individuals, there will be particular songs, new artists, or indeed entire genres of music that we're otherwise unfamiliar with. And when we do hear these sounds for the first time, there's a gap that emerges between how we're accustomed to making sense of um, and developing preferences around music and these new sounds that we're hearing for the first time. And we can think of this familiarity gap as a kind of distance. So the distance may be quite small or it could be quite large between what our normal, regular, normal, accustomed, habitual musical tastes are and this music that we're hearing for the first time. And this idea of distance has informed the development of recommendation services in platforms such as Spotify and YouTube. So what these recommendation algorithms tend to do is develop a profile of our musical preferences and then recommend artists and songs that are only a short distance away from what uh, it knows that we regularly listen to. And that's great in terms of getting us to spend more time on these particular platforms, but it's not so great when it comes to exposing us to truly unfamiliar music. So we might have access to a platform on Spotify with tens of millions of songs, so unprecedented access to music, but we really risk um, having our musical environment resemble something more of a filter bubble with only a really narrow range of musical sounds. So it's also perhaps unsurprising in this light that some studies have shown that up to 20% of the music on Spotify has actually never been listened to. So what can we do about this? Well, one of my research interests is particularly in the role of curation. So for music in particular, as audiences, the music that we actually reaches our ears is the result of some level of curation. So that might be traditional modes of curation, such as artistic programmers programming a concert, uh, or it could be a radio programmer uh, programming a radio broadcast, or indeed increasingly, it could be a software engineer developing an algorithm. But across all of these different platforms, some are much better than others when it comes to exposing audiences to unfamiliar music. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it's the fact that, well, live concerts, particularly when it comes to art or classical music, are by far the best at this. They can take the audience on a unique journey that's been crafted, exposing them to something familiar, and then uh, leading them onto something more esoteric. Digital platforms, the other, hand are by far the worst and offer by far the narrowest range of sounds that are presented to their audiences. Radio does sit somewhere you know, as a kind of midpoint between these two, but as radio is increasingly replaced by um, digital platforms, we really risk having a less innovative musical ecosystem. And for classical and art music, we can see this in Australia uh, in the fact that that results in there being far fewer Australian voices heard and far fewer opportunities indeed for female composers as well. Research does, however, suggest that all is far from lost. In some research studies we've done uh, here at Marx, we've developed recommendation services that try to recommend to people um, from the genre of Australian art music and look at their kind of responses. And that's really been positive in terms of showing that despite people's musical background, um, they've shown an amazing capacity to not only engage with, but derive pleasure from music, which may have otherwise been unfamiliar and musically distant from the music that they regularly listen to. Indeed, for people who were discovering this genre for the first time, the kinds of uh, recommended music that they enjoy the most didn't actually bear any relationship to how similar they were to the music that they regularly listened to. Instead, there were particular musical styles, particularly those which drew on traditions from jazz uh, and minimalist music, which actually act as the most effective kind of gateways to expose people to take an interest in a new genre of music. 
So while the, my interest in curation sets a lot of the context for how people engage with unfamiliar music, it also uh, connects with a really wide, wide range of research. And that ranges from you know, research into the cognitive perception of different mu musical stimuli through to how we actually form evaluations in response to particular pieces of music, to even the kinds of what kinds of pleasure and enjoyment do we derive and why do we listen to music together with the really broad kind of social dimensions of taste and preference. So as you listen to the music presented by Australisis, I'd invite you to reflect on some of these questions and consider your own relationship to the diverse and at times unfamiliar music that's being presented. Hi again. I want to talk uh, about modelling data we gather in experiments on music and also modelling in machine learning and the future of music creation using machine learning. So when we do experiments on how people perceive music, we often want to relate the outcome that we measure, for example, their perception of how arousing the music is. We want to relate those perceptions to the features of the music that we can measure. And I've been particularly interested in measuring features which are physical properties of the sound, such as its acoustic intensity, which is the energy that it possesses. It's the nearest thing to our perceptions of loudness, but also things like pitch, which we've talked about elsewhere, spectral pattern, that is the timbre, what distinguishes instruments or electroacoustic sonorities from each other. And I want to relate those kind of physical measures to the outcome perceptions. We do that by what's called modeling. And this involves predicting from the measured physical parameters the value that we measure and transforming the model, changing its parameters, the multipliers of the different factors in it and so on until it best fits the data. So that approach of modeling gives us sometimes very strong clues that a particular physical feature is an important influence. And one is the acoustic intensity contour. It seems that almost everybody perceives increasing loudness progressively as representing an increase in arousal. And so we thought we could do what we call a causal experiment, an experiment in which we keep everything constant, but for changing aspects of the intensity profile. So what we did with a Borzak Slavonic dance and with some electroacoustic music and a few other items was to invert the acoustic intensity profile. So where previously it had been going up and down, in the inversion, it was going down and up. Obviously, essentially, the prediction is that that would also inverse the perception of arousal. And we found a rather strong result to that effect, showing that it indeed seems to be causal. So that's an example of a model allowing us to gain mechanistic understanding, the role of acoustic intensity, which turns out to be very widespread. So a different kind of modeling is involved in machine learning. So Kate mentioned small neural nets in her talk. So while the nets that Kate talked about were very small with maybe a nodes, which are functional computing units, numbering up to about 20, and maybe parameters, all those numbers which transform data coming through the nodes, maybe parameters of 100 or very most 500. Nowadays, we deal with deep nets that constitute deep learning. They're deep because there are multiple layers of the nodes and each layer may contain many, many nodes so that overall the machine learning model may comprise millions of parameters. Since 2015, deep learning has been incredibly successful in many fields related to image, text and music. If you imagine an input from a piano player into a deep learning model, the input would contain a representation for each event that is sounded of how many notes are being played, what pitches they are, with what velocity the notes are attacked, which dictates its loudness on the piano, how long the note goes on for, and then also how long is the gap between this event and the next event. So the next event might be a single note, which would be a melody note, or it might be another chord, multiple pitches. So if we allow that somebody can play up to 10 notes at once, 
then one could envisage having representation of 10 notes with their accompanying velocities, durations, and so on, and maybe one inter-onset interval between that event and the next. So that's the kind of data which goes into one of these big deep learning models, and it is transformed by multiplications, linear and nonlinear, throughout the layers of the model until eventually it comes out in the same form as it went in with a prediction of the next event. So whereas with images, for example, machine learning is commonly used for categorization, you might want to know whether a photograph contains sea or land or cat or dog or whatever it is, and it can be incredibly effective at this. In our case, and similarly in the case with language, what we want to do is take a sequence which pre-exists and then use it to predict the next event that pre-existed and followed. Because if we can do that successfully, then of course we can provide a new sequence to the model and generate a new output, which might be potentially useful as new music. So what happens while the model is learning, that is it's being exposed to pre-existing sequences and it's learning the features of them so as to successfully predict it. What happens is that as each prediction comes out, it can of course be compared with the reality for the event that it is predicting. And so differences can be detected and in a kind of reverse through flow through the layers of the net, all the parameters, all the multipliers and so on that I was talking about can be adjusted slightly so as to improve the prediction. Then another load of data can come in, another prediction be made and the process continue. And if the training is successful, one can get a pretty good model, which is reasonably accurate at predicting the next event. So then one's in the position to use such a model to generate new music. And what I'm interested in doing is generating music, which is somewhat distinct what's, from what's coming, because it might have novelty, it might be expressive in a different way, it might appeal to me as a composer and improviser in a different way. So you might say, well, it sounds as if a given trigger would automatically produce the same output each time, why would that be interesting? Well, first of all, of course, one can change the triggers and they could be foreign to what has been learned. Secondly, one can, instead of saying, I'm only interested in the best, most likely prediction, one can say, well, there are a variety of predictions that could be made here, quite a few of which are perfectly plausible, I'm going to select amongst, for example, the top 20% of predictions. By that means you can introduce diversity. And one of the ways that we've tried to enforce long-term structure is using nets, which actually take information from many events past hundreds of preceding event inputs and use them also in part of the present prediction. So we have a variety of standard techniques to approach this. The latest one is called attention and may be beneficial in our system. And then the other aspect is that the precision towards which the, the model is driving can be a custom defined precision. So I define a precision which requires diversity in the output across a whole batch of outputs and which requires a pattern similarity across a large batch of outputs. Again, these are all things which are designed to produce long-term similarities, what we would call musical hierarchy, as well as short-term, reasonably precise predictions. So that's how those systems work. And I'm thinking of going further than this and using two different training sets to try to find spaces, predictions between them. So most of the corpora I'm using are my own. And then I could combine one of my own with a model which knows conventional Western classical music for the piano, for example, and then hope to find some spaces between them which produce different outputs. There's a lot of different approaches. So first of all, I'm going to play you an example which is entirely machine learned, a keyboard piece.
So after that excerpt, I just want to illustrate how one can use the triggers to control the nature of the output. In this case, to produce fairly repetitive music, which is like traditional minimal music from the period of Steve Reich, Phil Glass. It has repetition, changes of speed, features which will be very obvious to you, I think, which show that it is repetitive. But there is transformation. It is an evolving process. So I hope you enjoyed those couple of pieces and, and the idea that machine learning can be very exciting for the future of music generation. And this is the end of the science arts video. I hope you enjoy the remaining two videos.